Hello and welcome to Recyclist. I'm your host, Eric Provost, and today we are being joined by an incredibly special guest from Danny O Studio, artist, veteran, and Guinness World Record holder, Daniel O'Connor. Danny, thank you so much for joining us today on the Recyclist Podcast, and we'd also like to welcome the CEO of Diamond Scientific, Mr. Ramon Rivera, to the show. Thank you, Eric. It's, a, it's such a pleasure to be here and, and uh, exciting because we've got Danny O present and I was so interested in his background and, and what he's done in terms of recycling efforts and using his art that I wanted to be present. And for those who don't know about you, Danny, and, and the stuff that you've done, give us a little bit of background because you're an artist by trade, but you've been doing this for a long time, even dating back to your days in the military, correct? Right, that's right. Well, uh, thank you both for inviting me, too, because this has been um, an interesting story, the one we're going to talk about, to revisit. But from the very beginning, when I, was, uh, when I was in high school, my sister was sick with cancer. And uh, as a result, my brother Charlie and I pretty much did not go to high school. And um, at that time, the well, I did. I went to the school, but I only went to the art room. And so by the time I got out of high school, I didn't have the grades for college, but I did test well in the Navy. I tested well visually, which got me a job of photo mate. So I joined the service as a photographer from 81 to 86. It was like a five-year tour. But while I was doing it very soon into my, I was probably only in a little over a year, and my art got more notice than the, I was, I was a good photographer, still am a good photographer, but the, the <laughs> art leapfrogged, and I became a Navy artist. It's just what I do, different ways that I do it. Apparently enough to get uh, recognized by a certain admiral. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Oh, I like that story. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's my best Navy story, perhaps. Um, so I tried to paraphrase it down, but so I get on, I get in the Navy, I get on an aircraft carrier, and I'm and I'm a photographer, and I'm on shoot crew, which means I'm one of the t three guys that goes around and only makes pictures during the day, and then later I start at night. I start um, doing a lot of cartooning and my own artwork because I noticed that a lot of guys, it's a 12 on 12 off and the guys on their 12 off were sleeping. And we had a seven month cruise and I was like, I'm not gonna sleep. I'm gonna distill down my sleep and I'm gonna maximize my own personal growth. And they had a gym, so I went to the gym. Nobody used it. There were 5,000 guys on the ship. Almost no one used it, the same four or five of us. And then after that, I went upstairs and I started working on these cartoons. Then I get the uh, I get noticed within the command we we made like the yearbook which is like the school yearbook but it was a cruise book and and I start making all the cartoons for the cruise book well when the cruise is over we go to all these different ports all over it's an amazing tour and then the ship pulls into the Norfolk dry docks we we're in one day and my neighbor who was a yeoman asked if I want to go for a ride I had the day off I went with him we go to this building, there's a, a civilian, a GS-13 behind the door, his name's Gordon Rawlings, and Gordon changed my life. I show him my artwork, and he asks to uh, bring it and show it to someone else. I get invited up, and yeah, I meet the Admiral, who's in charge of every ship on the East Coast, uh, ComNav, Airland, and he says, uh, "With this all happens in this speed that I'll tell this story. I walk in the room, he shakes my hand, he says, Seaman O'Connor, your work, it's great. He's got it, he's got it in front of him. You know, Gordon's showing me, you know, we, hey, listen, would you like to work for me? I say, yes, sir. He picks up the phone, calls my ship. He asks for my warrant officer. He says, warrant officer, hey, is this Seaman O'Connor work for you? He says, yeah, sure. He says, well, <laughs> Seaman O'Connor works for me from now on. You understand that? And here, yeah, sure. Hangs up the phone, shakes my hand, gets me out of the room. I worked for the Admiral. I was his driver. I was his cartoonist. It was like, and then my story from there went into art in other ways in Virginia Beach. Shout out to 17th Street Surf Shop. <laughs> but that's that's initially how I got started. And then I just, I had these amazing opportunities when I was really young where people gave me a lot of credit and opportunity with my talent. Surf Shop was one that was happening the same time as this Admiral. I lived a life where I got to see what art could do. And I used the art quite often to create the life that I wanted, not the other way around. When Danny shared that story about the Admiral, mm -hmm. that's when I said, he's got to come on. The <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, we are the Recyclist Podcast. This is, you know, about conservation and, and the environment. So one of the reasons that uh, we wanted to bring you on is you have a fairly unique take on 
on conservation, and I think people would kind of be be interested in in how you approach that. Somewhere in the 90s, one winter, I spent a lot of time in my studio, and by spring, I knew that I was unhealthy in that I was unbalanced, and I wasn't smart enough to figure it out, but I was smart enough to know that I needed nature. That was what was this internal a uh, healing call for me was that you need to be outside. You can't live your life in a studio making art. It's just not going to work. And I had a lot of work at the time, so that's all I did. You know, I had a lot of jobs. So I, oh, I was a portrait painter at the time. So I just, I just painted, painted, painted all the time, and it, and it made me unbalanced. So I started going on these walks, and there were other things going on in my life where trust was an issue. I was dealing with trust and how to overcome trust, how to trust myself, and how to hear that, that inner guidance. And, true, and I really, truly wanted to exercise and grow that muscle more than the art because I, I didn't feel like I had a connection to it. So I started walking along the edges of Boston along because I lived in Chinatown in Boston, and I would go on these walks, these meditation walks, and at first I collected a lot of things, and I saw myself as like the beachcomber collector. And I grew up on Nantasket Beach, right on the water. And I always had a very spiritual connection to the beach. And when I was young, I felt like the beach was my artistic master, if that's not too grand. We would come to the ocean in the spring and the beach would be a mess. And well, some people would see it as a mess. I particularly was, and my brothers were, we were, uh, my sisters too, less than, but my brothers and I, we would drag stuff for a half a mile and build forts, and we would drag stuff throughout the winter. And it was the greatest form of, like, beachcombing finding and the amount of crap that we would drag from, like, seriously, you know, it was like Alphabet Streets from A, we lived on Q, well beyond A, we would drag it all the way down. And we had our boards, and by the spring, the board, there would be a whole cluster of all the kids in that area had grown this thing, and then they'd come and they'd clean the beach. So as I get older, I'm at the beach one summer, and I notice the plastic and the wash-up hasn't been cleaned up. Like, they don't have that service anymore. And um, I was always fascinated by beach wash-up. And so I started collecting all the number two plastic and bringing it to our family home, which was on the water. And in the basement had these big plastic bags, and I was like giving some sort of order to this stuff. And perhaps it had a higher value because it was, you know, so I loved collecting the, you know, so there was a bag of green, a bag of red, a bag of yellows. And um, I know that no one really spoke to me about what I was doing, but I think they thought I was crazy. You know, I'm like trying to like find order or something in the beach, and I collect a, quite a bit of stuff, but I had it ordered, so I, I thought it had... And I looked at it, and when they were in the bags, it was kind of beautiful. All the different greens was, like, gorgeous. Something about it was, like, kept feeding me to not stop. So when I go back to uh, Boston, I start walking on the waterways of Boston. I do the same thing. I do it on the Charles River. Um, and then I make some pieces out of the work, and I take it to New York City, and I show Alex John, who was never really a formal teacher of mine, but probably my greatest adult Mahatma that I came across that was human. And, had a, and, and I shared these works with him. And he lived right across, I was going to Cooper Union, and he lived across the street at Cooper Union where the old Blue Note was. And he was a jazz musician. It's kind of a fa fantastic story. But his, he saw them and he was like, oh, Dad, no, no, it's terrible. Now, Alex was the most supportive being ever, and he had never said anything to me, so I was like, wow, Alex. So I took those pieces, and I was very, you know, I traveled down there on a Greyhound bus with a dolly in Times Square. I had these things stacked up, and I wheeled them down to the East Village. So I put them back, I go back, but I loved Alex, and Alex was the truest of the true in my life. and. So I took them back, I got back to Chinatown, there was a dumpster, I got back at like three in the morning, threw them in the dumpster, covered them so no one would find them because there were other artists, all the artists, we dumpster dived like crazy, that's how we made a living. And um, I went back to the studio and I thought, what is the thing that I can save, that I can keep collecting because these, these meditation walks are very healthy for me. 
So that's another part of the story where I said, you know, I felt unhealthy. Now I'm out getting a lot of air. I'm working on my balance because I'm going rock to rock all the time. It's very slow. And I'm meditating the entire time or I'm chanting the entire time. So as I, as I was doing this, I also, this sounds, I felt like this job was given to me. And I knew this job was given to me. Not for, for, through spirit or through some, I didn't invent it. It sort of happened upon me. So I start collecting balls because they're the most um, beautiful of the found objects. It's a sphere, and in, within the sphere, everything comes to the sphere, the earth, you know, it's symbolically the most beautiful of the shapes that I could find. And I had been collecting pencils, pens, um, you name it, I collected it. And so to discard all that, and I only collected the balls. Then something really amazing happened because I was also really trying to tune into my own intuition. And I started to find these things like crazy. And I'd go in, I was waiting tables at the time, and I'd go in and I'd tell people, how many balls do you think I found today? And they're like, found? Did you take them? Did you take them to somebody's backyard? I'm like, no, pure finds. How many did I find? 12. I'd say, no, I found 76. What? Yeah, I went to do my laundry down at Charles Street. And, and here's the thing, though. I had learned that during a flood tide or a heavy rain, the Charles River would float up a couple of inches, right? And the balls that would come down from the tributaries, from Waltham and all these Lynn, <laughs> all these other places, would come and they'd get stuck in the reeds. And all I would have to do is go through, and you couldn't do it seasonally. It had to be best in the fall when the leaves were down or spring, before the growth. After the growth, everything is green. You can't see anything. So I always worked, I worked off months. Um, but the ball thing, then I started to invite people to come do it with me to see what are the chances that I could turn this into, like, if I can find 100, does 12 people make 1,000? And sure enough, when we, whenever I took people on these trips, we would pick something on the map because I started to follow the tributaries. Well, this might be a good spot. A swamp is actually a very good spot. Not to bring your friends, but to, to have ball finding thing. So then there'd be 12 people out, you know, we'd find these desolate areas no one would ever go. The only reason I added people to doing it was that um, this curator from the De Cordoba Museum, Nick Capasso, came into my studio to see my paintings. And he was immediately like asking me, what's this? And I tell him the story and he's like, Dick, couldn't even see the paintings, you know? It was, he was just like, wow, this is, I want this in the museum. Could you do this and put it on a wall? And of course I was, I had only one bucket and I was like, oh yeah, oh yeah, I can do that. In my mind, I'm like, oh yes, I can, I can do that. I couldn't, I didn't, you know, but I, he, you know, it was my first museum show. I'm like, can I do it? So uh, I gathered my friends, we started doing it, and I just became obsessive about it because with this project was coming um, a lot of press, a lot of articles, TV. It was nutty, and it wasn't, and even then I knew this isn't my art, but this is a shot, and this is legacy, and go for it. You know, go for the story. Go for, leave something behind, and who knows what happens in, in, in between. One of the best stories from that museum, though, it was, it was on these, this stairwell, right? So it was, it was about four stories up. I don't know, man, maybe 30, 40 people helped me assemble this. We always made it a party, but we assembled these panels. We take them to the museum. We assemble it, and I leave. And then I get, start getting calls from the preparator that the balls are dropping off. A ping pong ball falls and breaks open. Now this ball had been floating in the Charles River for, I don't know, 15 years. When that thing broke open, the water stunk so bad they closed the museum down. And they called me and they're like, you need to take this thing down and we can't have this because this they, they, we, 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 it smelled so bad. It was like egg drop soup. They were furious. So I, they give me this room and then for two weeks, me and JJ, who's now a very good painter, um, screwed like, du like hundreds of screws into the balls. And the whole time I'm just sweating bullets, like so much adrenaline of like, oh, I lost my opportunity. My one shot and I blew it. 
and I wasn't, you know, I wasn't prepared for it. Anyway, we fixed it, we put it up, it lasts long enough, but one of the saving graces was that I was a waiter, you know, so who I got along with best was the security guards. So they really liked me a lot. And every time I went to the museum, they would be like, Dan, and they'd give me a box. And it would have all the balls that had fallen off that they didn't tell up the chain of command. And that was like, I don't know, you know, it, uh, it saved me. So from there, it came down, and then it went to Mass Mocha. And at Mass Mocha, it really grew. They invited the world to come, you know, to see their museum. But as one of the, I was part of a show called Game Show. So you were allowed to play Danny O's ball game and bring balls. And by the time that it was there for a year, that's where I got the Guinness Book of World's record. And by the time I left, there were like over 6,000 balls had been donated, mailed, and sent to Mass Mocha. And they had a huge cage outside, and it continued to fill. And then from there, I did it with the band Fish. And then after that, it, it slowly dismantled. Yeah, that was something that I, I definitely wanted to ask you about, is you kind of touched on it briefly, just kind of glossed over the fact that you were in the Guinness Book of, of World Records. Some people may not may be wondering about kind of the scope of this project where you find just discarded items on the beach or the riverbed or something, but you collected enough of it to get you into the Guinness Book of World Records. Specifically, what did they uh, did they annotate you as? What, it, what, what was your exact record? I'm going to tell you the story behind why I got it. I think <laughs> it's much more interesting. But my thing is largest ball mosaic made from reclaimed balls or something. I'm not, something along those lines, 2005. But the story is that when I, when I brought the balls to Mass Mocha, they came with this fragrance, right? I mean, my studio reeked of river. It was nasty. I had a door open all the time. So when I brought it to the museum, this, this, it brought this scent with it. And they weren't prepared, nor did they like sort of that organic quality, but they wanted it to grow. When I get it to Mass Mocha, around the piece, there was uh, the, the piece that was there before me, the, the floor hadn't been totally cleaned. So I said, I can clean this up, you know. I should have let them do it, but I took it on. They didn't have a huge crew at the time. They were assembling other things. Anyway, the maintenance department had given me glossy paint, not satin. So there was this glow of, like, rolled out. It was horrible. So then they have a meeting in the courtyard, like, two days later with the curator, and, and everybody in the meetings were in sunglasses but me, and they're, like, glaring me down, like, you screwed up the museum, you know. And then from that moment on, the curator just never spoke to me ever again. That hurt, too, because I was like, I'd be in the museum, I'd be working on my piece, she'd be talking to, like, this German artist, and like, and I wouldn't even be like, hey, and this is another one of our artists. It was just like, I, I got iced. So I was, the show was called Game Show. So I said, all right, you know what? I'm going to win. I'm going to win Game Show. I'm going to get a Guinness Book of World's Record for, for my piece. And so I researched what it took to get one. And really, all you have to do is... Uh, create a category and then it should be something you know something interesting and I thought I had something interesting enough and we and then I asked the the mayor to officiate the count and you know I just got I, 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 I went down the list of what it took to get it and it wasn't that difficult and then when I got the Guinness book every paper in the region it was absolutely bananas the whole top fold, local artist gets Guinness Book, and then flip down, and there was a huge picture. It was, people were calling me. It was like, it was the weirdest thing, because I knew it was just a hook. It was a trick. It wasn't like, and it still is with my kids, I think, you know, which leads to this other cap project, you know. So congrats again on the world record, but uh, where has the, in recent years, uh, how has, you know, this this project, the, the ball uh, reclamation art project and, and other types of found object art. How has that kind of evolved and have you still been working with it? When I worked on the balls, I considered myself as the organizer of the ball family reunion. And if there was a ball in my vicinity, I would found it. I could track it. From the time I got the Guinness book, I turned my back on it because it was incredibly labor intensive. There was a lot of bending over, picking up. There was a lot of sorting because like color pixelated them. I had to rent a barn, a barn to store them. And if you can rent a U-Haul truck, the largest truck, that's what it took to move them, packed. 
not like a couple put some boxes in, but I stacked up the front all the way to the back and then lowered the thing. It was filled. That was exhausting. So I, I put it away for many reasons because I thought that my bigger goals, though it was, though I could have been doing that. I, I was invited to be on TV, like on Letterman, and that's how far back it was at Letterman. But it was like all those shows, they bring me in to do a, 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 a B-reel, but I, cu I couldn't put the words together. And there were all these producers talking to me, and I was like, whoa. I had a, a, a complete um, appreciation for what actors go through. But um, in recent years, I've, I've meditated on that while I collected balls, the other thing that I saw when I was out there all the time was plastic caps. And I would ignore them, but I always, there was another family, and I was always watching them because they were migrating with the balls, right? The, the bottles were not. The, that was <clears throat> what was haunting to me. There were all these plastic caps, and they were also beautiful, right? They're round. They're colorful. They're different sizes. And all the time I'm watching, looking for just the balls, I would see that, and I would think, whoa, there's a whole other body of work there some other time. But I've never returned to that because there was a certain obsessive quality that was happening in that drive to make that success that I, that really affected my mind and I didn't want to do that anymore. Like that much obsession for quest for success was a bad combo. So even though I went out trying to find inner balance, I, I overused it and then, you know, and then I realized now I'm a lot more balanced, I think. But when I look back and I think about the plastic that I saw, I have my own collection because I just like seeing them grow. And then different times I've taught in school systems where I'll be like an artist in residence and I share this project. So everyone in the school saves plastic, saves the caps. And then in each class, they found a different way to talk about it in math, the ratio. Like, why is it that yellow is such a scarce of all the colors at the end of the month? You can see there's not a lot of yellow. Very interesting. There's more green. There's a lot of white. There's a... So there were different ways in, in all the different classes where they could t find a way to talk about it. And then with them, I had, because I had a workforce now, I would only talk about it and they would do it. So... I would say, okay, let's order all the colors. And in like seven minutes, these 30 kids would organize all the color, all the caps. And then we'd, I'd say, let's make a fish. And they would start one end, and then before you know it, they'd have a fish. And it was, re the interesting part of them playing with them was, it was almost like Legos, and it was almost universal, because when I looked around, and when the teachers looked around, there wasn't a kid who wasn't somehow involved. Or like, you know, nobody seemed to be bored, not to brag on the project, but it had a way of t triggering imaginations with just caps, which was kind of fascinating. And so that's the way that I've shared it. And I've often, and part of the podcast is that, and, and thinking about what, what, what I was going to talk about is that I know that I'm, I'm not the one to be going out collecting them. I think I'm the one to talk about, hey, maybe you should. And what happens if you did? And what ha would happen if you did it in your community? And when I talked to Ray about it, about the cap specifically, because I also, I have, I have had some time when I've, when I've dove into the, the cap project, um, that I think it's a community thing. If a community adopted it and built it, anybody that saved a cap along the way, one cap, 10 caps, 50 caps, and then the goal is you get a Guinness Book of World's Record because it's very easy to do, right? Do it, the biggest blank made out of caps. You know, you do the, the biggest library emblem made of caps or whatever it might be. And then everybody that participated gets a Guinness Book of World's Record. I always thought it would be a cool project where if everybody in the town saved, then everybody would, you know, be able to share that collectively. And at the absolute worst, it would be cleaning up the environment and helping clean the community, right? Right. I was traveling in a little town called San Pancho, Mexico. I was telling my wife the other day uh, about meeting you, and she says, did he do that one in Mexico? And it's a mural made of caps. It's a recent mural. So, you know, my assumption is, is that they'd seen that art form yeah, somewhere. 
Oh, yeah. I and, didn't invent it. Yeah, they'd seen that art form somewhere, and they said, oh, let's do this. And for me, you know, with my history in the recycling business, I just was so intrigued by hearing your story. Trash is, can be beautiful, too. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and it sustains a lot of people. You mm-hmm. know, recycling sustains a lot of people, not only, in your case, an artist, but, you know, people that actually collect it, process it. And uh, so the movement for, you know, people to get excited about saying, hey, let's save that piece of plastic and put it in a recycle bin. You know, your awareness, I think, has made a difference. And that's the back end story for me. Mm-hmm. Because as an, you know, as a, an operator, a guy that ran a, you know, recycling or transfer station, solid waste, the collection side of the garbage side, you know, for me, what you've done is you built awareness hmm. through, your, through all your work. And that's, to me, more important than anything. <laughs> the beautiful thing is that since I've done these projects, people will email me or they'll see something out. Uh, like my kids sent me pictures from Maine where they saw a shed that was covered and it was almost like, well, they're doing it better than I, you know. And in and, and different places, too, in, in these beautiful, long, where I'm like, oh, yeah, they took it. But I think they're, they're beautifully done. And, and there's some that, are, that take them apart. I mean, it's, it's extraordinary what some people do. I knew I had a, a legend to create in a window of time, and I dedicated that time to it. But I also knew walking amongst trash all the time took a, took a heaviness to it. Like, there was a heaviness. It wasn't always light. You know, sometimes I come away like, ooh, I don't want to do that forever. So the moment you started this walk, this journey, we were just starting recycling in the United States. I mean, historically, retail establishments collected cardboard, Mm -hmm. and there were some glass efforts. But plastic had become a big part of a consumer's waste problem, Mm -hmm. right? So Mm -hmm. all of a sudden, we have this plastic. We don't know what to do with it. So artists like you in that time period, especially in the 90s, built this awareness around, you know, there's other options here. And by the way, just picking it up at mm-hmm. the beach, mm-hmm. you know, it was a worthy endeavor. Mm-hmm. You know, cleaning and, up your and, beach. And can be playful. And it can be playful. That's right. So I think that you, you deserve a lot of credit. <laughs> and you could probably walk those beaches today. And as a result, and those tributaries that you walked and they're going to be much cleaner today. I, I, I expect they would be because of the awareness you, that was developed back in those early years uh, just through your art form and through your personal caring. So that's really, I, I think, what's really important here. If I had any effect like that, that's strange. You know, it's, I don't know how to take that because when I did it, it, it wasn't for that. But I have learned that life is, you know, you throw something, that, that pebble, that ripple effect, how it can grow. And I've seen other things that I've done in art and how those have grown over time were in in ways that I couldn't believe, you know. So there's one more person I want to mention. His name is Michael Davies. He was a Canadian artist who was uh, collecting balls at the same time as I was for the same reasons, drawn to it. And when we meet, when we shared stories, I don't don't know how to describe it, but he was so like-minded that in that time, we both knew that we didn't come up with these ideas. We were just following, and I knew that the whole time, that this wasn't my thing. I was just somehow taking direction, and I was going to follow it. But Michael was the same way, and he added a lot to the piece at Mass Mocha, and um, he was a a terrific artist, too. Uh, Well, allow me to extend a thank you as well for joining us today on Recycle. It's an absolutely fascinating story, and... Uh, again, uh, we'll make sure to to plug your Instagram so people can go and see all the, the great work that you've done. Thank you for, for sharing your story with us. And if you'd like to see more of Danny O, you can follow him on Instagram at Danny O Studio 1963. And you can also reach Diamond Scientific online at diamondsci.com. That's diamondsci.com. Or call them at 321-223. 7500. Thank you all so much for listening, and we'll see you back next week for another episode of Recyclist. Thank you.